Welcome to Shaping Davos. You're plugging in to the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum, the meeting that brings together government, business, civil society leaders, academics, and you into a global conversation about the most important topics shaping the world today. The Shaping Davos journey starts in a city near you with our millennial community, the Global Shapers. And those voices, your voice, feeds into this global conversation we're hosting at Shaping Davos. And here we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. That's the huge wave of change that's gonna transform the world around us. And that revolution is gonna bring incredible change to societies, to countries, to industries, and most important, to generations. And we want millennial voices involved in conversations. So you'll be joining in on conversations about jobs, about millennials, about the future of work. We're really excited to have you online coming and bringing your voice into those conversations. So from me, Adrian Monk, thank you very much for being part of this process. Look forward to seeing and hearing your contribution. Good day. Uh, where, wherever you are in the world, we are webcasting this, so I'm delighted to be, be inviting uh, cities from all around into this wonderful session on the last day of the World Economic Forum in Davos. And uh, this is a very, great session, and we say that all the time, I know, but I mean it here, because this is going to involve uh, the, the shapers from around the world, thousands of young people, brilliant people who are going to shape the future of this world. You often hear about the World Economic Forum, you often hear about Davos and the 0.1% that are here, but the shapers bring in new voices, new perspectives, uh, disruption, and brilliance, and that's why we're going to have uh, two panelists here, but four people from around the world talking about the future of cities and reimagining urban life. I first want to plug the hashtag, uh, which please everybody here and there use uh, use the uh, hashtag Shaping Cities, and uh, I'll be seeing great um, tweets from wherever on a, uh, a, a, a tablet, and so we can try to get that into the conversation as we go. So anyone in the audience here too. Uh, we'll have a few minutes for questions later, but you can also get questions and, and thoughts in on the, um, uh, the hashtag. So, it is my honor to be here. I'm Jeff Jarvis. I uh, teach at the City University of New York, Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, I'm from New York. We all think our cities are the greatest, but I'm right on Times Square and what we think of as the center of the universe. And uh, I love my city. I love what the City University does, and that's why it's an honor to be here talking about the future of our planet through being together as people. Uh, I'm also honored to, uh, to uh, uh, give you to two great panelists who are here. Uh, Carlo Ratti uh, is the director of a, a Sensible City Laboratory at MIT, uh, the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Uh, Carlo does amazing things uh, that he'll tell you about in a moment. Nahid Denshi is the first uh, Muslim mayor in North America, a master of Twitter, and doing great things out of Calgary in involving citizens in new ways and, and reshaping that city. Uh, the format here is we're going to go through three parts. The first, we're going to talk about the challenges, uh, the, the, the context and where we are. Then we're going to go to the solutions and opportunities, and, and then uh, uh, just discuss where we are from that, and then go on our ways. So first, let me uh, shift over to introduce our two panelists uh, into the discussion. I've already done that. And uh, talk about, we want to look, explore the current challenges in urban design and uh, urban life the roles of various stakeholders in this. And um, uh, so, Carlo, if you would uh, start by giving us a few minutes on the context of cities today. Sure, um, thank you. Um, well, you know, about the challenges. Uh, I would say the challenges in cities are the challenges today as they've been over the past around 10,000 years. Uh, cities just start around 10,000 years, years ago when humanity really starts and realizes that living together, we, we can do more. By living together, we can make sure that the total is more of the sum of the individual parts. You know, cities didn't exist and around 10,000 years ago came into existence. But this, uh, this density of people coming together, this density that continues for thousands of years and it's accelerating today. We were just discussing before in one of the sessions about India. India where tens of millions of people move to, to cities every year. Uh, I believe it's 40 people every, every minute. Or you know about uh, global urbanization, the idea that uh, by 2030, five, six billion people could actually live in cities. Well, all of this is increased density clearly brings a lot of uh, interesting potential, the potential to, to be together, to exchange ideas, and to be more productive, but also great challenges. 
Those are some of the challenges about traffic, about pollution, about the energy consumption. Just four numbers about cities, 250, 75, and 80. Cities are only 2% of the crust of the planet, but they're 50% of the population today. They're 75% of energy consumption, 80% of CO2 emissions. So these are some of the big challenges we have. If you're able to do something to make cities more, more efficient, then the impact can be, can be striking at a global level. It is no surprise, again, we discussed it in a few sessions over the past few days, that, uh, that the COP21 in Paris just a few weeks ago, thinking about climate change, thinking about how we can address it, well, cities were on the center stage. So I would say these are some of the challenges, and before we look later about, about the solution and some of the ideas, but I just want to hint at something, which is what people usually refer to as uh, a smart city. Smart city is nothing else than IoT, Internet of Things. It's about technology, digital technology entering physical space. If you want, it's about the convergence of the digital and the physical layer in, in the places we live. Well, IoT, smart cities, can actually provide part of the answer, as we will discuss later. Do you also want to plug the work of the forum in the, in the report and show that to the camera? Yes, uh, I thought uh, I, I'll do this. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, no, totally, sure, yes. Uh, uh, this is it, but uh, we'll, we'll discuss a bit in a moment more about the solution. The forum, with the forum, I, I, I had the, uh, the pleasure, the privilege of uh, uh, chairing the Global Agenda Council on, on Future Cities. And what we've been doing with all the Global Agenda Council members is really work on, on urban innovations. And we have a small report about the top 10 urban innovations, and I think you know, in, in a few minutes we'll, we'll look at that in, in more detail. But here's the report, which is available for everybody in printed form here, the forum, but also for all the shapers, you can just download it online for, from the WEF website. Mr. Mayor. Well, thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity to be here with all of you today, and hello to all the shapers uh, watching from all over the world. I had the great pleasure of speaking at the Shaper North America conference uh, held in Calgary last year, and I'm still running off the energy of meeting all of those folks. And energy is, I think, an interesting word, because to Carlo's point, those numbers are really important. The 50 is the most important. This is the first time in the history of humanity that the majority of people in the world live in cities. That is a profound shift and change in how we think about our world, and how we think about energy use, to your point, how we think about emissions, but importantly as well, how we think about how we live together, who we are, how we move, how we work, how we create economic impact, uh, and particularly how we interact with one another, not just as economic or environmental units, but as neighbors. And I think that this is an important part of all we do. I think you were missing a number, and I wonder if you know it, which is, I think it's 65, which is the percentage of the world GDP that yeah. happens in cities. Yeah. And so 5% of the crust of the earth, 65% yeah. of the economy, half of the people. So clearly, we need to think about cities in a new way. Now, a few years ago, when I first became mayor, I had the opportunity to visit China for the first time. And I got to Beijing after a long flight, <laughs> was met by a friendly young man at the airport gate who whisked me down secret corridors to a secret car park. I wasn't quite sure what was about to happen. Into a vehicle with Chinese government flags on it on special lanes to whisk me to a meeting with the mayor of Beijing because my flight had been delayed and uh, I, I had to get there in time. So I got into this meeting, having just gotten off this long flight, it was exactly as you would imagine, two chairs, a plant in the middle, his translator behind him, my translator behind me, a red rope with a whole bunch of cameras behind it, and suddenly we're expected to talk uh, in serial monologues. So what am I going to say? So I say to the mayor of Beijing... You're a politician. I can't imagine you're going to have trouble with this. <laughs> Remember all of that stuff. Long flight, no shower, whole bit, right? And so I say to him, you know, Mayor, um, one of the things that we have in common is we are swiftly growing cities. You know, I, I am the fastest growing city uh, in Canada. And he said, I know. We add about 750,000 people a year. We are currently building 300 kilometers of subway, and I think it was the sixth at the time, Ring Road. And I thought to myself, well, we added 35,000 people last year, <laughs> and I just finished the largest uh, public works project in our history, which was a 9.7 kilometer extension of our LRT. But this, the problems are exactly the same. And I really want to get into some of the solutions, some of the things we think about. Maybe I'll just say one more sentence about the context. Mm -hmm. And the context is, how do we create spaces that are sustainable? And when I use the word sustainable, I mean it in three ways. How do we create spaces that are financially sustainable? 
where we can actually afford the infrastructure and afford to have people live in these places. Number two, how can we create places that are, of course, environmentally sustainable? How do we manage the environmental footprint of cities and build economies of scale rather than the diseconomies in terms of emissions uh, that Carlo was talking about? And third, and to me most important, how do we build places that are socially sustainable? How do we build places where, by definition, people of very different backgrounds are living in the same space and breathing the same air, where there are inequities almost by definition in wealth, in background, in faith, in ethnicity, um, in family history? And how do we make those places that build on the strengths of that diversity and be able to build places where people can work together hand in hand, breathing the same air as their neighbors, to build community together? And I think that, of everything, when we talk about built space and um, all the other things that cities do, that creation of that social space is the key thing we have to solve. I, I couldn't agree more. I, in, in journalism, I think we've got to shift the focus of journalism to what communities need before it's what we want to do. And the same with cities and, 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 and government. We've got to understand the needs of communities better. And I think that that's why the hubs you're about to hear from are so important. All around the world, the Forum has organized uh, global shapers, young people who are taking charge of the future of their world. And in these cities, they are holding events just like this. And so the forum has spread out across, across the world here. And we have four here this morning, four amazing people. Um, in Moscow, I'm sorry, in, um, I forget the order, in Islamabad, Moscow, Jeddah, and Pune. Uh, so we have uh, Javeria Masood in Islamabad, who is the founder and design uh, and strategy lead at the Urban Practice Pakistan. In Moscow, Natalia Fishman, who is advisor to the president of the Republic of Tartistan, advisor to the head of the Moscow City Department of Culture. In uh, Jeddah, Masin Al-Jabri, uh, director general of the Economic Development Divisions at the Economic Cities Authority. And uh, Babi Nimbalkar in Pune, director of Delivering Change Foundation and head of the Strategic Leadership Council of the Sakai Group. Uh, so we'd like to start, they're going to have two minutes each to talk about, again, the context in their cities and what they're trying to do with that. So Javeria, over to you. Hi, I'm very glad to be a part of this. So uh, before I highlight the problems, I'm just going to take a few seconds and introduce Islamabad, um, just to provide a little more context for those of you who are not familiar with the city. So Islamabad is a very new city, comparatively. It was built in the 50s and 60s is actually when it started getting occupied. Uh, it's the only plan in the only grid city of Pakistan um, and was made to be the capital. So it has this very strong parliamentarian pursuit and bureaucratic presence. Uh, but in the last few decades, it has seen a very increased number of uh, people moving in, so great urbanization. And our local activity that we did was actually um, in collaboration with the Ministry of Planning, Development, and Reform. So some of the bigger concerns that came out of that discussion, uh, which was partly a roundtable and partly breakout sessions, was um, mobility. So Islamabad has a twin city, Rawat Bindi, and a big task force of Islamabad comes daily in and out from the twin city and surrounding neighbors. And that influx of people on daily basis and multiple hours creates a lot of um, hassle in terms of traffic jams and there are only a couple of routes. So that mobility within the city and outside is a big issue. Uh, and the second concern is the dichotomy of different segments that live within Islamabad. So one side you have very, very elite groups and on the other you have um, informal slum settlements. And then these different segments of societies are not very um, connected, neither economically, neither socially. Um, and so these are some of the issues that we looked into and how we can bring in different people from different segments and kind of brainstorm on it. Uh, we also have um, issues regarding, um, you know, power shortage, which we experience on and off, but hopefully are working to make it better. Um, and then in terms of solutions, we're, we're also trying to highlight what some of the other, like what are the projected uh, concerns that come forward. So because Osama was never um, envisioned to cater to this big of a population, we're sort of forcing, um, forcing a, you know, a collapse of infrastructure. It's not happening right now, but I think if this rate maintains, we'll see that the infrastructure may or may not support 
on the you know the flux that the city currently has. Thank you very much, Deveria. Uh, on to you, Natalia, in Moscow. Uh, don't forget to unmute your microphone, Natalia, if you could. There, I, I think, think it's good. okay. And and yes, you, now you're good, and you can shout at us. I will shout at you. Uh, hello, honorable colleagues. Uh, it's a great great pleasure to be here with you today. I used to work for the Moscow City Department of Culture, which has gone and the city has gone great change in terms of cultural policies and involvement of uh, citizens into the uh, urban life. And now I have moved to a city called Kazan. Uh, which is the capital of the Republic of Tatarstan, a major region within the Russian Federation. Together with our colleagues from the Moscow Hub, we have actually more focused on a general problem which we can witness in basically any city of uh, our country, and I think that which is relevant to almost anyone dealing with the problems at question, and this is uh, the question of how we deal with the lack of trust between the citizens and the uh, city officials and um, uh, how we uh, teach everyone to get the responsibility of uh, what we act how we actually should work together to tackle certain problems which arouse and moreover more than anything uh, we lack the skills and the technologies that uh, we would use in order to build that uh, mutual trust and to build on the responsibility. So I think that the major question for us is how we uh, cooperate and how we come to this social sustainability, which you were mentioning in your introductory speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia. And now to Jeddah and Masin. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for the opportunity and hi to follow panelists. Uh, a brief thing about Jeddah. Jeddah is about a thousand years old. But uh, in the past 15 years, I think the population doubled in Jeddah. And that created one of the challenges is the unhealthy lifestyle due to the poor walkability of the city. Uh, the city design is not really designed to have a, to be a walkable. There's a lack of pedestrian space. There's a, which increases also with the heat and the uh, and the the climate of the city is kind of is kind of hot during the summer or all year long. So uh, I think these are the uh, one of the major challenges of not not having let's say a pedestrian lanes the uh, the lack of, of uh, pedestrian uh, walkways pathways in in the city and this uh, uh, added to uh, the healthy uh, the unhealthy lifestyle that we have currently. Uh, another also major uh, issue that we believe that uh, I believe in we have in Jeddah here is that it's absolutely the traffic uh, uh, due to the increase of the uh, of the population in the past 10 15 years that also and there's a big uh, uh, dependency on uh, cars for transportation uh, that because of there's no uh, let's see innovative public transportation that ended up in really traffic jams and horrible traffic jams that uh, Jeddah is facing uh, daily. Uh, one of that is also the design of the city because it's uh, the poor design of the uh, community services or the uh, schools are really not in the same neighborhoods as uh, uh, where we live. That uh, resulted in you need to do lots of trips back and forth on different parts of the city. That increases the traffic and also increases the, the demand of uh, traffic jams on, uh, that we have in the city. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mazen. And uh, fourth is Bobby from Pune. Uh, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, Pune is uh, one of the oldest city in uh, India. And uh, uh, it's, it's very, very well poised and it's growing uh, because uh, it is called Oxford of East. We have uh, huge educational institutes which are there in Pune. We also have a huge automobile manufacturing base, and now we have a IT base which is there in uh, Pune. And because of this, there is a whole lot of migration which is happening from villages and the rural side to, to Pune. And also Pune is very close to financial capital of uh, India. Uh, Pune um, has, has uh, different challenges, but as part of the Pune is also one of the cities which is part of the smart city mission across India. And based on this mission, we recently did a massive uh, citizen, citizen engagement program where we wanted to try and understand um, you know, what are the challenges which are 
there from a citizen's perspective. And uh, we did a pan-city um, uh, challenges as well as the area-wise challenges, because if you look at it from a pan-city, we have mobility as an issue. We have solid waste management as an issue. And we also need to create a startup culture to create more opportunities um, in, in, in Pune. Uh, that said, when we look at area-wise issues and challenges, they are uh, different. In, in some areas, there are safety-related issues. In some areas, there is affordable housing-related issues. There are some areas where we need to have slum redevelopment issues. So, uh, But with this overall massive citizen engagement program, one thing was uh, very clear. Now we understand exactly what are the issues and challenges citizens are facing, which helps the civic body along with the uh, corporate uh, NGOs uh, and academia to really plan the city in much better. Thank you. Bobby, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like our, our panelists here in Davos to just spend one minute each reacting to what you've heard about the context. I, I hear a lot of commonality here in infrastructure, growth, crowding, uh, the need for citizen engagement, uh, housing problems, traffic. Uh, any reaction that each of you have in turn? You know, it's the, it's the same everywhere. This is the most fascinating thing about urban design and how we think about cities, is if you ask people anywhere in the world, what do you want in your neighborhood? What do you want in your city? And if you think of the neighborhood as the building block of the city, they always say the same things. I want to be able to walk to the store. I want to be able to walk in safety so my kids can get to school. I want a diversity of choices in how I move around. I want to be close to my work. I don't want to spend my life commuting. I want safe, decent housing. I want to live in a neighborhood where my parents and my grandparents are also living so I have free childcare. But different people of different generations are together. Um, and I want generally, not always, but generally, I want my kids to grow up in a neighborhood with different kinds of people. So. If everybody wants that, why don't we build that? Why were the people in Jeddah, for example, I'll pick on you, building communities without sidewalks when we knew people want sidewalks? So thinking about the barriers that are preventing us from actually meeting the market need of what people actually want in their communities is, I think, a very profound thing that we need to get beyond. Carla. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, I would add to that, um, really, if you look at this, uh, some, of the, some of the issues have uh, technological solutions. When you think about transportation, there's going to be a lot of changes in, uh, in the next few years uh, using digital platforms, self-driving, and so on. But ultimately, the important thing is really is about what we want as citizens. It's about you know, how we can, ca I think it boils down to what we were saying before, which is about coming together. That's what cities are for. And you know, it's coming together about how we move together and we meet each other, is <clears throat> each other is about the diversity in the neighborhood, is about coming together online in order to, to help shape and transform our cities. Which I think you know, what you're showing here is also a great example of that, of how we can leverage new IT technologies in order to come together, come together between all over the world in Davos here today, but also continuing this discussion on the Shapers platform, really in order, in order to transform space. I think you know, that's really the key important thing about citizens. We ne should never, never just focus on technology. People tried it in the 20th century, and that's how some of those absurd cities without sidewalk appeared. Uh, you know, in the 19, in um, halfway through the, the 20th century, some new cities were built, such as Chandigarh in, in India, such as Brasilia in, uh, in, in Brazil. And you know, if you look at Brasilia, it was a very interesting city. But they just forgot about something that was, was people. people. That, that there's no sidewalks there. The city is beautiful. When you land there with the, from the plane, you look at it, and it's like you know, the, the, the wings of a plane. But then when you're in there, uh, people are, are not part of the equation. I think that's, that's, that's probably where we should go back to. And, and then the net, of course, is having a positive and negative effect here, too. Uh, I, I, I work in the center of Times Square, but I have to walk 20, 25 minutes to find a bookstore now because they don't exist. Uh, browsing in stores change. Now let's move to the important thing, which is solutions. And that's what the forum is about, is trying to bring people together, convene people to find solutions. So each of our two panelists here will give three minutes of uh, some solutions they're looking at and working on. And then we'll once again go back to our, our uh, global shapers 
and find out what they're working on. So, Carla, why don't you start? Sure. And uh, and uh, so what I wanted to share is uh, what, what, what I showed before is uh, the work we've been doing together with all of the Global Agenda Council on Future Cities here at the Forum. As you might know, the Global Agenda Council constantly meets during the year. And in, in this case, we produced this, uh, this report on, on the top 10 urban innovations. Uh, the amazing thing is that the forum really convenes people from, from different backgrounds and from, from all over the world. Uh, so at the Global Agenda Council, we got people from academia, from industry, we got mayors. Uh, really, and in, in try to, to, to look at some of the issues you were mentioning. Now, when you were talking, I, I was looking at top 10 urban innovations. And you know, if you look at this, many of the points resonate through these pages. In the top 10, we had to narrow down. So we had a, a longer list, but it had to narrow down. Uh, but really, it's about, uh, I would say, it's about technological solutions, but that are always, always uh, in the light of how this can transform citizen life and how this can empower people to, to make more informed decisions in, in their city. So again, the important thing is what uh, the mayor was saying before is about the social sustainability of the city. This certainly is the ultimate goal, not the technological, not the technological one. And I just want to mention about one point that, uh, that because we didn't discuss it yet, but this is actually what we decided to focus as Global Agenda Council. Uh, we decided this, we, when we met uh, just a few weeks ago, all together in, in Abu Dhabi, we said, well, we need to pick one of these and try to make it the reality by the end of our mandate in around one year. And, um, and we decided to focus on, on the third innovation here, on what is the third innovation, which, uh, which was about uh, you know, green spaces. Uh, green spaces in cities are vital. They're vital not only because of pollution, not only because of uh, fighting the urban heat island, but they're vital because they reconnect us with nature, with the rhythm of nature. So it's very important to bring back, uh, back uh, nature into the city. And, uh, and starting with an experiment that um, was launched by one of our members, Rob Adams, in the city of Melbourne, uh, we said, well, why don't we try to do this a global platform, thanks to the forum? And that's about uh, creating something like an open street map of trees so we can map trees in cities all around the world. We can kind of map the urban canopy and then allow citizens to take action in order to, to modify it, to basically ask the mayor to plant more trees. You can benchmark one city against another one. It becomes a way really where we can better understand nature in our cities and also enhance it. I would also recommend looking at something called Sustainable Jersey, which is now doing lead-like uh, certification of towns across New Jersey to get them to compete with each other to be more sustainable in many definitions. That's great. Nahida. Well, you know, getting back to my three themes of sustainability, financial, environmental and social. You know, cities tend to do the same thing. So for a handy categorization, we have five things that we focus on. The first is a city that moves. And it's about creating mobility choice for people uh, to ensure that even in a city like mine that is built for a long time around the automobile, that people have choices, whether that be walking, cycling, or particular public transport. Congestion is the greatest bugbear of cities. It steals people's quality of life. It's bad for the environment. And the best way to deal with that is to give people mobility choice. So the best, best way is to get them not to have to travel so much through your built space, but then to give them choice in mobility. So the second is a healthy and green city. And so the idea there is about the real nuts and bolts of what makes cities work. You know, I have 20,000 colleagues at the city of Calgary that do work every day to keep us healthy and safe and alive. You know, we have a gift that a billion people in the world don't have, which is that 300,000 buildings in the city and every single one of them has a little miracle in it and that's a tap. And out of that tap comes clean, safe water that won't make your kids sick. And so focusing on water, on our impact on the watershed, on wastewater, on storm management, all of this stuff we don't like to talk about much, but is incredibly important. And as people around the world know, the other part of that is solid waste. Figuring out what to do with your trash, your recycling, your composting. Those are pieces that really matter because those beautiful green spaces only work when you have all the infrastructure underneath to actually make it work as well. But as we build density in our cities, building lungs in those neighborhoods, having a place where you can kick around a soccer ball, is tremendously important. The third is a prosperous city. And that's about social inclusion and economic development and ensuring that the city remains an economic engine because cities are at their heart an economic unit. So you know, in Calgary, certainly we are focused on the energy sector, but we're also focused, as is everyone, on education, innovation, entrepreneurship, on integration of new comers to the community and on ensuring that opportunity, I, I call it a city of opportunity where nobody cares who your daddy was or where you went to school, or your background or your faith or whom you love. 
We just care about whether you're smart and whether you're willing to work hard. And making sure that that systemically happens in the city is extraordinarily important for all of us. A city of inspiring neighborhoods, I won't go into a bunch of detail, that's about your built space. And it's about ensuring that work and shopping and home are close to each other, that public spaces are inspiring, that people are driven by the space around them to spend time together in the public sphere. They're not atomized uh, into their own families. For me, what's very important is the fifth and final one, which is a well-run city. Uh, and that's about efficiency and management. It's about making eff effective and good use of tax dollars, about balancing tax dollars and user fees. All of that only works on a base of transparency, accountability, and civic engagement. And I'll say one last thing about civic engagement. You know, we changed our budget process when I became mayor. On, we turned it on its head. In the first year that I was mayor, 18,000 Calgarians participated in our budgeting process answering very basic questions like, what do you expect your city to do and how do you want to pay for it? That number has grown and grown and grown uh, in my city. But my favorite part of all of it is we learned that traditional open houses where you have to go at 6 o'clock in the evening and see a bunch of uh, poster boards and city staff standing next to them don't really work. So we've done some really fun, innovative things online that you can see at calgary.ca. But the best thing we've done is something called the engagement bus. Imagine you're waiting for your bus in the morning. And instead of your regular bus coming up, a big multicolored bus that is covered in post-it notes shows up at your bus stop. And if you're lucky enough to get the engagement bus, you don't have to pay your fare that day. But in return for not paying your fare, you get to talk to the city managers who are on the bus about whatever issue we need to talk to people about. That, that's great. Uh, people have to put down their, their iPhones. Uh, now to the shapers and the important work that they're doing. We'll do this in the same order. So uh, you each have three minutes to tell us how you're going to solve all the problems of your gigantic cities. Javeria, I'll start with you. So we love this engagement bus. It would be amazing if we could have that here as well. <laughs> but um, some of the solutions that we in that meeting spoke about was, um, you know, having citizen engagement. So make sure that uh, there's this um, bridge between government or making decisions or, you know, throwing out um, planning, development and projects, but make sure that citizens are engaged at every level of those projects so people really are at the heart of this. Um, the other is to incorporate smart technologies and smart systems and try to deploy um, information, um, again, taking it forward to citizen. And the third is, um, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to look up Islamabad even um, on Google, but it's very beautiful, very green, mountains and all of that. But um, so the good thing is that it's maintained. And what we really want is that that is not taken over by social enterprise or government uh, infrastructure projects. And the third is um, to make sure that um, we have walkable cities. So have more sidewalks, create more public platforms so that different segments of societies have more platforms to engage with each other. Um, and really make sure that um, each person is contributing to that. So not just have the government take or initiate projects, but try to come up with uh, social entrepreneurial ventures or small initiatives that are community-led, community-driven, that really support the collective vision of a smart city. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Natalia in Moscow. Thank you so very much. I told you already we were more focusing on engaging citizens, so we had a lot of discussions. First of all, for instance, we have an application in Moscow uh, which is called the Active Citizen, which actually makes more than a quarter of uh, Moscow citizens uh, every uh, two weeks answer uh, certain questions. And this is a great number, and they tend to influence certain decisions, but sometimes they criticize the Moscow government for uh, giving very limited options in this process. The other experience we have, and I think is uh, quite nice, is the one we had in Kazan, because we have uh, been uh, transforming 140 parks within half a year, and in uh, transformation of every park, we were organizing offline meetings with the citizens, demonstrating projects, and asking them to comment on them. But then we met a serious obstacle and problem, which is that the uh, older generation tend to come to those meetings, and the younger ones, the people of our age, uh, they try to ignore those, uh, those events, and therefore we are now in search of uh, different mechanisms which we could use, the te technological uh, um, mechanism we could use to engage the younger generations and to direct influence on how the public spaces of their cities would look like, and we would be most grateful for advice. 
Uh, also, we are uh, pretty sure that we need to build on institutes of activism and institutes of advocacy, because I think, we think, that we have a huge problem with the uh, lack of the so-called uh, interpreters, because uh, we have a situation when the government and the citizens tend to speak totally different languages, they, uh, they lack uh, the terms that we, they would share, uh, for instance, we have uh, situations when there are activists who are fighting to preserve uh, heritage uh, and uh, historical uh, architectural sites. And obviously, sometimes the city officials, they do not realize the uh, extent to how, of how much it is important to keep the heart of the city. So I think that the only way that we could find a consensus is to create those advocacy mechanisms when there are people on behalf of the government and people of, on behalf of those uh, active communities uh, cooperating together, trying to come to certain conclusions. And the last but not least principle we were discussing is that it is very important for the government, especially in a country when the government is so strong, and I actually think that this is uh, important for all the, uh, the cities who are participating in this discussion today. It is very important for the city to, for, for, for the city and for the government in general to keep activists independent from themselves. Because if you start offering too much help to the activists, uh, basically incorporating them within your structure, you kill the, uh, you kill the independent opposition to you who will help you not make a mistake governing the city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now next to Masan in Jeddah. Hi. Well, one of the solutions, I believe, it's uh, to do with technology. That's in the terms of the smart city. We can uh, try to ease up the problem with the traffic, utilizing the technology of the smart city, managing the traffic, or giving the, the citizens more options uh, traffic routes uh, that they can ease up this problem. Also, that we increase the security of having more options to walk in the city if it's the city are more, let's say, walk safe. Uh, if these uh, these are the options, and one of the other solutions is maybe rethinking their current master planning of the city because the city outgrew its uh, its master plan. How can we fix this? How can we re-engineer it? How can we uh, redesign it? And making it less uh, dependent on cars and more dependent on walking and more walkable. Uh, if we utilize the, 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 these both factors, I think one of them is short term, one of them is long term. And of course, introducing uh, innovative uh, public transportation, effective public trans uh, transportation, it will less uh, increase the demand on cars and uh, between the, all the three of them, uh, increasing the and uh, additional, increasing the awareness. Through the technology, through the, uh, the, the, the apps or the mobile apps, or through the, the, the city itself, increasing the awareness of uh, needing of more walking and uh, having a safer roads and uh, less traffic, would, uh, my opinion, help uh, reduce the issue and uh, solve the problem, make you know Jeddah livable again, or at least uh, more uh, brighter in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, Bobby in Pune. Uh, thank you again. The cities will be smarter if the citizens of that city think that the city is smart. So, you know, I, I think that is the premise. We have already seeded in um, the bottoms of approach by understanding, by doing the mass scale citizen engagement to understand issues and challenges. The, the overall vision of Pune Smart City is based on what citizens want, because if we deliver um, you know, what citizens want, uh, that would be a faster way of moving towards smartness. Um, we, we have a challenge where we have basic infrastructure which needs to be done at pan city level, um, as well as try and initiate uh, technology usage, um, you know, to uh, the smart technology usage to, uh, to move forward. So this, this is what we uh, intend to do. Now our biggest challenge is how do we make this overall citizen engagement on a sustainable basis? Because if we do that, then citizens working along with civic bodies, we can move towards faster development and making Pune smart city. Uh, and, and that is the focus which we are now putting in, uh, how citizens can uh, help citizens on, on various aspects, whether it is emergency services, whether somebody is in distress, instead of waiting for emergency services come in, how citizens can start helping citizens. So 
this is what can be done using smart technologies. Uh, another example, how citizens can help uh, on the on the infrastructure side, if there is a solid waste management, um, you know, uh, which needs to be done at the pan city level, uh, can citizens uh, segregate the waste? How we can provide an uh, an awareness as well as ensure that the citizens are segregating the waste, and that would be a much much effective solution which can be implemented. So that is what uh, our main focus is going to be to have a sustainable citizen engagement program uh, which will be running helping uh, the civic body implement the solutions faster. Thank you. Thank you all four. Uh, I, I'm so struck by the optimism that I hear and, and, and the, you're using the tools of information and technology and, uh, but you didn't talk about trying to build huge amounts of infrastructure, instead about empowering the citizens to, to in turn create the kind of city they want. Um, I also thank you for your brevity and clarity because uh, that gives us more time for a discussion with people here in the room and on Twitter. I want to remind you of the Shaping Cities hashtag, again, Shaping Cities. If you have any questions, challenges, ideas, um, anything at all, please put that in here and we'll try to get that in as well. Before that, though, uh, you are speaking to Davos, to the world's machers who are here, uh, and there is power, and there is authority, and there are resources that exist here. And this is the opportunity that I think is very important for you to challenge Davos and say, what do you need, not of the forum, but of the people the forum has convened here? And just really quickly, for a half a minute each, uh, let's reverse the order and start with you, Bobby and Pune. What do you want the Davosians to do for your city? Uh, what we feel is uh, the problems and the issues and challenges which we have in Pune is, should not be limited to Pune itself. We want to expose these issues and challenges which we have um, to Davos, to everyone uh, there, where we can learn, where, where, where the research institutes are researching based on not the issues and challenges which are there in the developed cities, but ones which are in the developing cities, so they can have a look at it and provide us solutions which can be implemented. How citizen engagement, smart technologies can be, which are very, very effective in a developed uh, uh, nation, how it can be customized, it can be localized based on the density which we have, as well as um, the scale which we have, and, 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 and the, you know, the way we are starting. So, you know, I think it is important that we need to have a sister city kind of a concept or maybe many sister city kind of a concept where we, we learn and there is a knowledge transfer, technology transfer based on the issues and challenges which we have here. I think that is what our biggest ask from Davos. That's a wonderful idea uh, of sister, sister cities. And I think Davos can manage to curate that and, and, and convene that. Masan. I think more focus on the PPP model, public-private partnerships, and I think that will uh, give us more leverage in the cities and how can we, let's say, uh, speed up the momentum of developing the city and solving our problems. We cannot we all rely on the city and uh, just uh, and leave it at that. I think uh, more partnership, more citizen engagement will uh, do us, uh, can that will assist us in that and having think about models and think about initiatives that uh, both the public and the private can engage in, that would, I think, uh, speed up the momentum and uh, bring uh, quicker uh, solutions. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Natalia, over to you. Uh, unmute your mic, please. The basic, uh, the basic first one from everyone here from the previous discussion was how were the cities selected? Why are the four cities brought together in one group? We are very curious. So it's very important to us. And uh, the other question uh, that I was having is if we could not just set up the sister cities uh, system, but uh, if we could first set up a platform to share the technological and other experiences uh, really quickly between ourselves. Thank you. I think uh, that can be done. And uh, uh, last to you, Javeria, your, your ask to uh, the people of Davos. So two things. One, uh, the continuation of what already is happening. Um, you know, bringing youth in the center of this and engaging us. And then the second is that um, you know the four four cities were working 
in different cities, but on similar themes and similar concerns. Um, what would be really good is if maybe in future we could collectively do something. So have one strategy, one urban intervention, let's say, and have it um, so sort of disperse in different cities and see how people respond to it. Um, and, you know, an exchange of knowledge share, there's this pool of research that is happening all across the world, perhaps more implementable um, strategies on how we can collectively and individually work on those together. Thank you so much. Uh, now I want, we have a few minutes here for some questions, challenges, ideas, examples from the room. Is there anyone here who has anything? Yes. If you could also identify yourself. Hello, yeah, my name is Neeraj and I live in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, it's a young nation which was born in 71 and I've been living in that city for, as I said, over 30 years now. And Dubai is a very good example of, uh, of a city which has really come about in the last 15 years. And it, was, uh, it wasn't what it is now, but it has really come about through a function of community engagement good governance, and, and, and not, just throwing good, not just throwing lots of money at it, because Dubai doesn't really have oil. It is like any other city in the world which, where it needs to create the resource. But the rulers of Dubai are very, very engaged in creating infrastructure. They would go at night to the airport, see what the citizen problems are. And they have managed to create really on three principles. One is adoption of E as a basis for running governments, where all the departments of the government now engage with citizens on an electronic basis. You can actually file a complaint. So if you have a traffic accident, you can just take a picture and post it online, and within an hour, you get a police report. You don't have to visit a police station. Uh, the second thing they've done is the competition between the government departments on a star rating system, mm. where each government department competes with each other on upgrading the quality of service. Where I was leading with this is, I mean, there should be examples like that, which we can perhaps bring to forum from other parts of the world. And I think that will then enable a collaborative effort towards understanding this. Thank you. I think this idea of sharing things and then competing to outdo each other is, is, is a really important opportunity. Yes. Again, please identify yourself. <clears throat> I'm Elias Selman from Chile. Uh, <clears throat> I've been hearing very, very interested what all these young people are talking about. And I would say that there's, you're lacking two issues that are very important. It is safe. I mean, I, I didn't hear that word during your, all, all of your, uh, I mean, I, I, I've been seeing Paul in Latin America that when you ask the people, what is the most you need in the city? It's safeness. I mean, crime is another issue that you should address. I mean, when I'm talking about crime, I'm not just talking about someone is going to kill some robbery and all that kind of stuff. Second thing is schooling. I didn't hear about schooling. Uh, if I choose a place to live, I need to think about where one my kid is going to uh, go to get education and health at the same time, health care. So, uh, I, think, I mean, it's not just about smart city, it's to be connected or have a walkable city. It's first of all, safeness, schooling, <clears throat> education, and healthcare. Thank you. Uh, I think we did, we did hear from Brune about safety. We heard from Jeddah about safety. Oh, sorry, sorry. We heard from Brune about safety. We heard from Jeddah about wanting, wanting streets and sidewalks to be safe and, and make that. But I think what's interesting is that your perspective is properly government um, services. What does the government provide in a city? And interestingly, I think the, the hub folks are talking about what the citizens can provide, and that's the, that's the perfect combination. Do we have time for one more very quick one, if we could? And again, say who you are. Yes. Uh, my name is Piroshka Kanadji. I'm from LSC UK. Um, one area where I see a, a real crisis in big cities is housing, mm -hmm. housing for young people. What can be done, of course, at the national level is a big question, but also at the local level to improve, in, increase the supply of, of housing. There is a tremendous, there's a huge social problem going forward in major cities. Any reaction from our hub? If you put your hand up, if you have any reaction to anything you've heard from the audience here, and we can call on you. Uh, yes, uh, Basen. Yes, uh, regarding, I do agree about the, the 
safety is really important, and uh, I agree with the, with the with the colleague about it's not about uh, about from uh, being robbed or being attacked. It's about when you walk in the streets and be safe, not to have any accidents, or is it proper lighting? I think yes, we did we did address that. And one fact that maybe I did not really uh, focus on. It is the walkability. When uh, when you have all the social services, what I mean by the social services are schooling and hospitals. These are what you call social services. Uh, within the neighborhood, then it's walkable. Then it's a really important. Uh, then you can you can solve the uh, other problems of having relying on cars. And I do agree with him fully. These are most important things. But I think we in the back of our heads, we, these are by default. These are by default should be available. Our request now is having these. Uh, demands within the neighborhood instead of me driving uh, all day long just for back and forth to get them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on on Twitter from the hashtag from the from the Jetta Hub. Uh, I'll get back to you in one second, Bobby. Uh, from first the, uh, the the net from Twitter. God bless Twitter. Um, Jetta Hub asks, how are we dealing with the lack of trust between citizens and citizen authorities? I think in Calgary, you've concentrated a lot on that. And what are two or three of your best practices to share about trust? Sure. Um, of course, being a politician, I'll take the opportunity to answer that question and two others. But briefly. So, very quickly. <laughs> of course, safety is important. I did mention it at the beginning that people need to feel safe on their streets uh, all day and night. And of course, policing is part of that. Community-based safety standards, community-based policing, understanding root causes, all really important stuff. Housing is probably the most critical thing we need to think about in big cities because big cities are becoming victims of our own success. So you're from LSC, who can afford to live in London today <laughs> um, if you're not a financier? How in the world after 2008 did the financiers become even more powerful? It's a whole other question for Davos. But um, part of that is technology, part of it is being able to craft great cities in different spaces, you know, in different places. Um, but part of it as well is really figuring out how you work with housing at, at every level, from housing ownership to market rental to subsidized housing and release supply valves at each point of that. Finally, this issue of trust is critical. You know, we find that particularly in North America, I think it's the same in Western Europe, people's trust in government is declining. It's almost as bad as their trust in journalists. And uh, <laughs> actually worse in most cases. <laughs> But we don't find that as much at the municipal level, at least in North America, because people feel that the services that the city is providing are services that they use and need every day. And so there's a certain real sense of um, skin in the game with the municipal order of government. Now, of course, you've got to you know, not be corrupt. So let's start there. But I think working with tremendous transparency and accessibility to information and accountability is really important. So people want to know how my city is spending money at calgary.ca. You can see every line of our budget. Every manager, city manager comes live on TV and on the web every year to defend their budget of their department. No other, no other governments do this, but that really engenders Openness trust. Openness and transparency, we've heard a lot. And let's add that journalism might have a role in that. Yes. We have one quick minute for you, Bobby, to, to add in yours, your response. I uh, just want to talk about uh, safety, affordable housing, education. These are all issues, but they are very specific neighborhood issues. It's not across Pan City. So uh, that's one. So we, we have all those issues. And of course, we need to handle those based on uh, uh, neighborhood. The second thing uh, I want to mention about the trust and, and the reason, uh, one of the uh, one more reason why we did this overall mass scale citizen engagement is to build the trust between the municipal corporation and the citizens. The municipal corporation officials had never visited citizen households to really find out what they, what do they think about that city and what are the issues and challenges. It is, uh, it's never happened. And, and with this overall process, uh, after, after the overall vision of the smart city, it has been very clear now in citizens' mind that Municipal Corporation is hearing us and has built the overall plan based on our inputs. And I, I think this is a great step forward from building the trust between the civic body and citizens. Thank you very much, Bobby. Thank you, all, 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 all the Hub uh, folks. And, and please thank the folks who were there with you with these great ideas. Um, before we sum up very briefly with like a minute each, Carlo, uh, what challenge do you have in turn for the shapers and the hubs that they have uh, they've asked what Davos should do. What do you think from Davos they should do? 
Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I want to say I, I really like the solutions they were, were hinting at. And I think all the solutions go boiled down to a similar thing. And it reminded me about you know, Frank Lloyd Wright, the great American architect from the 20th century. He once was asked, you know, how do you do great architecture? And he said, you know, you need three things, clients, clients, clients. And I think in your solutions, it is more about citizens, citizens, yes. citizens. That's what resonates behind all the solutions. And, and so if all of this is about citizens, is all of this is about coming together, is about you know, coming together and developing new ideas on different platforms, then I think uh, you know, Davos, Davos here is certainly a great platform, but you as shapers are also a great, great global platform. And so instead of uh, you know, maybe in a slightly a Canadian way, uh, I would say, instead of uh, asking you know, what Davos could do for you, let's see what you could do for Davos. Uh, for Davos. Uh, and my suggestion would be, perhaps, as here we are planning to take some of the 10 innovations, especially the third one, and deploy it uh, with, uh, with a global network, uh, then that's something we could do together. We could actually start taking some of the innovations from the uh, Global Agenda Council on Future Cities, and perhaps work, collaborate together uh, on one of them, and leveraging the power that you have is covering the planet is a, is a great uh, number of uh, uh, smart young people connected from all over the world and, and trying to test some of this. Again, you know, to start from citizenship in order to change our cities. And you have one minute, Nahid. I would just simply say that to all the shapers out there that your most powerful tool is your voice. The power that we have in shaping our communities is the power of framing choices and framing the narrative. So if, for example, we look at the recent conversation that we've had around refugees around the world, I prefer to use the term human beings to the term refugees. Uh, however, we see that people who live in communities, people who live in cities have changed the narrative. They've changed the narrative through their thought and their action in welcoming people, in integrating them and bringing them into their community. So as young people who are strong in your community, the biggest thing you can do is change the narrative and talk about why aren't we building neighborhoods that people can live in? Why aren't we welcoming newcomers in the way we should? Why aren't we building environmentally, financially, and uh, socially sustainable spaces? And you would be surprised how framing things and the choices that people make every day makes extraordinary change. I want to thank you both. I really want to thank all four of you. Uh, I don't know what hour it is, wherever you are, and I know it was difficult to get Skype working. Let's praise Skype that it didn't hey, break Skype. down. Uh, <laughs> which is risky, but first let's have a, a hand for all of you uh, out there in the hubs. And I think we heard loud and clear what, what you want to do, which is right, is you're doing amazing things in your cities. You want to share those things with each other. I think you want to even compete with each other. And that is the thing that I think the forum can specialize in, is convening that discussion and that mechanism. So I want to thank you folks who are here, and we're about to end uh, this magical, strange time here at Davos and head back into our homes uh, and our cities. And I want to thank you, those of you who are watching online and keep the conversation going with the Shaping Cities tag. And uh, thank you very much. We'll see you uh, next year, but sooner. Thanks. Thanks.